Good evening. Thank you for your patience. Those of you who know that I run a tight ship probably are going to give me a bad time for starting a minute or two late. I'm Charles Ungerleiter. It's my privilege to be the moderator this evening, which primarily means that I am the person who asks you to turn off your cell phone <laughs> or anything else that is annoying for the evening. <laughs> Well, I got to be careful about that because I saw I said that, and some people turned to their right or left. And anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to go there. Um, let me just check my cue cards to see where we are. But I think first I'd like to call on Marnie Point uh, to give the land acknowledgement. Thanks, Marnie. Sorry, I'm getting starstruck here. <laughs> Si atala tente at wananu ai si ais tenawa. Just want to welcome you all here to the unceded and traditional Musqueam territory of the Hunkaminam speaking people. We are people of this point. We walked and talked and lived on this point. My name is Marnie Point because we were in this place before contact. I just want to raise my hands in honor and esteem of my CM at the good work that you do and the people behind you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Marnie. Um, it, I'm delighted to see so many people, so many people actually who have been at previous distinguished lectures. Um, that means that you've come back because it has a good reputation or an the others of you that for whom this is the first time, you must have been told how good they are, and I'm, this evening won't disappoint either. So I'd like to call on uh, Lillian Borax Nemeth to tell about the Janusz Korshak Society. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Janusz Korczak Association of Canada, welcome. Um, I'm here to make some comments about Janusz Korczak, who I don't know if you know that he was the champion of children's rights many, many years ago. And uh, he was a teacher. He ran orphanages. He devoted his entire life to children. So I would like to start by reading to you a small a, a, an excerpt of a poem he wrote called The Teacher's Prayer, which I translated from the Polish. Although gray and humble in your presence, Lord, I stand before you consumed with longing, whispering quietly, I state my wish in a voice of unfaltering will. My eyes fire a plea beyond the clouds. Standing tall, I ask not for myself. Please, endow the children with good will. Offer them help in their efforts. Give their toil your blessing. Lead them along a path that is not the easiest, but most excellent. When I was a young child, imprisoned by the Nazis, behind the wall, a 10-foot wall, brick wall, I heard many stories about Dr. Korczak from my father, 
You see, Korchak and his orphanage were also imprisoned by the same wall in the same ghetto, the Warsaw Ghetto. My father loved and admired Korchak. and even helped him on occasion to get food, which was very hard to get at the time, for the orphans. Stories of Korchak stayed with me all of my life. To me, Janusz Korczak was a hero, especially at a time when my parents and I emigrated to Canada, and I was filled with memories of horrors of injustices imposed by a society which hated my people. But my parents set about the business of living in a new world. There was a silence in our home. I was told not to discuss the war, to forget, start living a Canadian life. I was left to myself to cope with something that had left a deep scar on my soul and no one listened, and no one was interested, that is when I wished that there was someone like Dr. Korchak to hear me out. It has been said and written that Dr. Janusz Korczak, a pediatrician, author, and caregiver, shaped children's souls. He was the advocate for their rights, the right to love, with the right to respect, to education, good health, and above all, his belief that children should grow up to be themselves and not what others want them to become. He shaped children's souls, not into what he wanted them to be, but by nourishing who they inherently were. Korchak observed and listened to children, never judging, criticizing, or showing intolerance. He cultivated their needs as citizens of the world, teaching them to be good people who know their roots and to be proud of their heritage and not just to forget it. He often criticized parents who enforced their views and needs on their child. After all, a young child would even give up his own needs and desires just to be loved by his or her parents. He trained teachers to listen and take seriously their pupils' grievances and concerns. One of his tenets of children's rights was their right to be heard. Korchak listened to children in many different ways. In his famous ghetto diary, he wrote, and I quote, the unforgettable sight of the dormitory coming awake. A sleepy gaze, languid motions, or a sudden leaping out of bed. One of them rubs his eyes, another wipes the corner of his mouth with his sleeve or his nightshirt, still another stroke his ear, strokes his ear, stretches holding an article of clothing in his hand, stares motionless into space. He can be energetic or phlegmatic, skillful, clumsy, self-assured, or timid, with precision or carelessness, deliberate or mechanical. These are the real tests. You can sum him up at a glance. Who is he? And why he always acts this way? Or if he's not always, why? why? If, if not always today, why today? If not always, why today? I'm sorry, unquote. So this is how Korchak listened to children making their problems and behavior important. He believed that children are the power and the energy which should be harnessed in collaboration with adults to make this a better society. He believed that one learns through listening to children, not only with your ears, but with your whole being. He writes, one needs to absorb and experience the child until he understands her or him not only with his head, but with his heart. During the Nazi persecution, Korczak, when offered a reprieve from deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto, would not abandon his children in their last journey to the cattle cars 
heading for Treblinka, death camp. He refused, saying, my children need me. I deplore desertion. He went with them, and they all perished. But he handed us the flaming torch of wisdom and pedagogy, which is being passed on from one generation to another, that it might light the path to the well-being of all children in the world. And that is the reason we are here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Um, I missed a very important thing, and I was uh, dazzled by so many distinguished guests here this evening, but there are at least uh, four, if you'll permit me, and those who don't get mentioned, I apologize. Um, Chancellor Lindsey Gordon, if you'd stand up. Thank you. Dr. Pam Ratner, who is VP and uh, Associate Vice President. Pam, pardon? She's not here. Okay. Uh, Helen Burt. Is Helen here? No. Um, and Wendy Yip. Wendy Yip is Ambassador for Education. Welcome. Let me, call, let me call on Jerry Nussbaum and uh, Dean Bly Frank to present the award to Stephanie Black. We just would like to uh, congratulate uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Black on a great achievement. On, uh, we are very, very proud on the, on the research that you've uh, done and we would like to present you with a certificate, certificate uh, that comes together with a scholarship. Good evening, everyone. Senator Sinclair, Dean Frank. I'm honored to be the 2019 recipient of the Janusz Korczak Association of Canada's Graduate Scholarship in Children's Rights and Indigenous Education. My research centers around access to high quality sexuality education in Vancouver public schools. The BC government mandates that comprehensive sexuality education be provided in all schools. Yet sexuality education in Vancouver has been described as hit or miss highlighting that some students have access to higher quality sex ed taught by trained sexuality educators, while others do not. Evidence has shown that compre comprehensive sexuality education can improve knowledge and self-esteem, change attitudes and gender and social norms, particularly when taught by trained professionals. Unfortunately, in Vancouver, to date, no studies have documented who is teaching sexuality education, how they have been trained, how they are teaching it, and if all students are receiving equitable access to expertly trained educators. My research seeks to address this deficit and to understand the political economy of the delivery of sex ed in Vancouver schools. I'm also hoping to understand what equality implications might be for students who cannot access trained sexuality educators. I'd like to thank the Janusz Korczak Association of Canada and the Faculty of Education for choosing me as their scholarship winner for 2019. This funding will help me pay for my tuition enabling me to continue my studies. I'm very grateful that you have chosen me this year. Thank you. I'd like to call upon my colleague and friend, Dr. Jan Hare, who is the Associate Dean of Indigenous Education 
in the Faculty of Education to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Here we go. Sorry, I've got to raise this. Um, so miigwech, uh, Dr. Angerleiter, uh, bojo, ani, uh, greetings, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am privileged this evening to introduce uh, Mija, uh, sorry, Mijana Gijik, uh, which means the one who speaks of pictures in the sky in the Anishinaabeoan uh, language or Ojibwe language, which might be more familiar to some of you here. You may uh, know him better by his English name or uh, by one of his many roles, titles, and honorifics. The Honorable uh, Murray Sinclair is a lawyer, a judge, a commissioner, a senator, a fourth degree uh, Medewan member of the uh, Ojibwe Three Fire Society, and throughout, a, and throughout a tireless advocate for the rights of Indigenous people. Senator Sinclair was born on the Selkirk um, Sorry, was born in the Selkirk area, north of Winnipeg, on the former St. Peter's Reserve, and was raised by his grandparents, Jim and Catherine Sinclair. He was enrolled at the University of Manitoba for two years, but postponed his degree to return home in order to care for his ailing grandmother. In 1976, Sinclair enrolled in the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Law. He graduated in 1979 and since then has earned several honorary degrees from various Canadian universities. He, uh, has, he was called to the Manitoba Bar in 1980 and began practicing law. He focused primarily on civil and criminal litigation, Indigenous law and human rights. Over time, he became known for his expertise in the field and his ability to skillfully balance the Canadian legal system and the traditional teachings of the Anishinaabe and other Indigenous peoples. In those early years, uh, he struggled to gain the respect that he deserved. In one of his first cases, the judge mistook him for the defendant and asked him what he was charged with. This incident demonstrated precisely why Sinclair felt he was called to practice law. His opinions often drew media attention, with one critique of the justice system producing the headline, Police Prey on Natives, Lawyer Says. In 1988, at the age of 37, Sinclair became Manitoba's first and Canada's second Indigenous judge. That same year, he was appointed co-commissioner of the public inquiry into the administration of justice and Aboriginal people, which investigated systemic racism within Manitoba's criminal justice system. The report, which contained over 300 recommendations, caused the Manitoba government to re-examine the way it has treated its Indigenous peoples and marked a turning point for the treatment of Indigenous peoples here in Canada. In 2007, survivors of Canada's residential schools reached a settlement with the federal government and churches across Canada. As a facet of his settlement, uh, sorry, a, a as a facet of this settlement, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established to tell the history of residential schools. First approached in 2007 to chair the commission, Justice Sinclair initially turned down the opportunity. In 2009, he was approached once again, feeling that the initial commission had done little to ease the survivor's pain, he accepted the position. By 2015, more than 7,000 former students had testified. The final report, spanning six volumes, made 94 recommendations or calls to action to the federal government. It also documented the systemic abuse by the schools against children, uh, against the children, policies that Sinclair referred to as cultural genocide. In 2016, the Governor General appointed Sinclair as Manitoba's Senator in Parliament. With his appointment, Sinclair became the nation's 16th Indigenous Senator. Since his appointment, Sinclair has sat on several Senate Standing Committees, including those on Indigenous Peoples. And over the course of his long career, Senator Sinclair has been awarded a variety of honors, including the Mahatma Gandhi Prize for Peace, the Mandela Award, uh, the Tarn Poleski Award for Human Rights, and the Meredith Service Cross for his service on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And I have the honor this evening of presenting the Honorable Murray Sinclair.
I want to acknowledge the um, land upon which we stand and where this event is being held. I'd also like to uh, thank the university for inviting me to be here and to deliver this lecture and also all of those who are here uh, to welcome me and to be part of this evening's event. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Hare for the fine introduction. Uh, I, I always get a little leery about introductions because they can be very, very long. <laughs> they can also be very, very short. I was uh, at an, a survivor's gathering during the TRC process and um, we had a room filled with people, about 2,800 or 2,000. 3,000 survivors were gathered together in Saskatoon in order to um, just talk to us about uh, how they wanted one of our events to be held and to share some of their thoughts. Uh, but we had forgotten that this was the first time the survivors in Saskatchewan had gathered together. And so they were visiting with each other, hadn't seen each other some of them since school days, uh, and they were chatting and visiting and talking, having a good old time. And the time came to, um, to start, and um, unlike the, the fine chair we had this evening to get things underway who quickly brought you under control, we had a survivor who was called upon to do that in that particular group, <laughs> and he had no control whatsoever over that crap. <laughs> and he stood there and he yelled at them to get their attention. He swore at them. <laughs> and finally he introduced me in what has come to be the shortest introduction I have ever received. <laughs> he said, shut up, sit down, here he is. So, next time, Jan, you know, <laughs> you'll remember that, okay? Uh, you don't have to worry about all those nice uh, flowery words and doing all that research. You found out things that I didn't think people were aware of anymore. So, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I also uh, want to acknowledge my friends who are here. It's good to see you again. I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, and those of you who I've met for the first time while I was here this week, um, thank you all for being here, and uh, I hope that you enjoy the evening. <clears throat> I want to begin just by um, acknowledging that uh, while I'm here, my family is uh, traveling back from a gathering uh, in which they have just uh, put into the earth uh, one of their, our nephews who passed away because of a, a fentanyl overdose that he uh, experience, so drugs have been uh, a challenge for our community for a long time, and so they've just returned. I was just talking to my wife on the phone uh, just before I got here to see how she was doing, and she was, uh, she was uh, recovering well because she found on the way home two quilt stores and one fabric store. Um, she hadn't yet discovered the shoe store that Jan introduced us to last time that we were here, uh, where she bought seven pairs of fluvogs, I think. They're, they're fluvogs? Yeah? All I remember is it was $2,000 worth of shoes when, by the time we left. And, you know, when we just recently moved from a large house, 3,200 square foot house, into a condo, 1,300 square foot condo. And so that calls for purging. <laughs> and so in order to purge, you've got to first of all gather together all the things that you're prepared to look at maybe moving into storage or getting rid of. And so one of the things that we gathered together was my wife's shoe collection. <laughs> Imelda Marcos had nothing on this lady. <laughs> she had 128 pairs of shoes. Some of them were still in boxes the original boxes that they came in. And she was 
hesitant <laughs> to get rid of them, but we managed to convince her. So she identified a number of pairs and, uh, and donated them to the North End Women's Centre uh, in uh, Winnipeg to uh, help the women there who were going in search of employment to be able to add to their wardrobe. Uh, so the first trip by my daughters to take the shoes there consisted of a carload of 32 shoes, which they took to the to the center and uh, distributed right away. And the next trip, they took another 32 pairs of shoes. And they said when they got there the second time, the lineup going into the center <laughs> <laughs> went around the block. <laughs> and so uh, they got half of the collection. So which was good. <laughs> Speaking of my wife, you know, she's, um, she's my, what's the word? Boss. <laughs> That's the word. Yeah, just to tell you what the nature of our relationship is, you know, in our, in our um, traditions, um, we belong to different clans, and I belong to the fish clan. Fish clan are the philosophers, the thinkers, the seers, the ones that uh, talk about uh, things that uh, help people understand what's going on. And so I come from that, that clan. She belongs to the bear clan. And so <laughs> when you have a fish clan who's married to a bear clan person, guess who wins? isn't the fish clan. <laughs> she says the uh, fish clan only exists to feed the bear. <clears throat> so, that's why I'm here. <laughs> the lovely lady. When we, when we first met, uh, I want to share this little story with you. When we first met, uh, I was, uh, I'd just recently been appointed the associate chief judge of the provincial court and I was the head of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, we were walking down the street one day to go to a restaurant and we ran into this Anishinaabe guy who was walking in the other direction. And they started talking to each other, my wife and this guy, like they were old friends. And I gathered they'd gone to school together or something, so anyway they were yakking and I was standing there waiting to be introduced and waiting and waiting and it never happened. And they went their separate ways. And he went on and we started on to the restaurant again. And I said to her, well, that was interesting. And she said, what? I said, well, you guys talked for five minutes and you didn't even introduce me to him. And she said, oh, he's nobody. And right then I knew. You know, but I'm a dumb guy, so I didn't know enough <laughs> not to say nothing. <laughs> and I said, he's an old boyfriend, isn't he? <laughs> and she said, why do you say that? I said, well, just because. So we could, walked on a little further, and I said, well, you're lucky. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well... It's me. I'm associate chief judge of the provincial court. I've got a long and very good law experience. I've got a good reputation as a lawyer. I'm the commissioner for the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. And uh, one of the leading lights in the legal community here in Winnipeg. And if you'd married him, you'd be living in Split Lake as a wife of a teacher. She said, hell, if I'd married him, he would have been the associate chief judge. <laughs> you guys know Catherine, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah? So, anyway, um, so I'm, I'm going to be able to go home tomorrow and see her again. Um, I want to talk uh, about children, indigenous children in Canada. 
and I want to talk about it in the context of residential schools, obviously, uh, because I think not enough of us know the story. Yeah, and I want to talk about what it is that we need to do about the legacy coming out of that history. But I want you to join with me for a moment, if you can, and, and, uh, and help me get this story off on the right foot by taking out your cell phones. Because I want you to do the opposite of what you were instructed to do. I want you to turn your phones on. Could you do that for me? Take your phones out, turn them on. Turn the sound off. I don't want any ringing going on while you've got them on. Because <clears throat> I want you to go to the photos on your phone. Now, normally at this time, I, I would have a photo of my granddaughter, Sarah, up here. But um, we didn't get here in time for me to be able to, to put it up. But take a, take a look at your photos. You got your photo? Show me the picture of your favorite baby photo. All right, the favorite baby photo on your list. So, yeah, see? It's beautiful. How old? Four months. Hold them up. Show me the baby photos. Wow. <laughs> That's an action shot. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? Show me the... Oh, you got one too, Verna. Good for you. Grand grandchild? Great grandchild. Great grandchild? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Keep them up. I want to see them. I want to see them. Wow. Really nice photos. So I want you to take a few minutes, if you don't mind, and just talk to your neighbors. Oh, you got a whole crowd of them there. Like, you, you, your kids travel in packs. <laughs> um, I want you to take a few minutes and talk to the person beside you about who's in that photo. Just tell them that baby's name and what they do, what they're like. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Okay. Can I get can I get your attention back? <laughs> Shut up. Sit down. Here he is. <laughs> Keep the photos up. Okay. I still want to see him. I want to see him. All right. You've told everybody around you what the baby's name is and what the baby's like and how, how they mistreat you. Right. Now, I want you to do this for me. I want you to delete that photo. No. Why not? You can't delete a photo? Well, I understand totally. I could never do that either. But just remember this as we're talking, okay? Residential schools were about Mothers who lost their babies. Mothers who had their babies taken away from them. Through no other reason than the fact that somebody wanted to take them away to teach them to be something other than they were when they were born. To take them away from their love, from their warmth, from their home, from their community, from their language, from their culture, and indoctrinate them into something different. When confederation occurred, the relationship between indigenous people and the rest of society changed drastically. Up until that time, it had been, relatively speaking, a relationship of equals. In 1763, the government of England, through the crown, king of England, issued a royal proclamation in which it said to the indigenous people of North America, we promise you that you will be able to keep your territories, 
and we will not interfere with your territories until you are ready to surrender them to us, and only us, in a proper surrendering ceremony. And we promise you that we will not interfere with the way that you function within your community. We will not interfere with the way you do things. You will be able to survive on your land in the way that you have always been able to do it, and we will not do nothing to change that. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 was a an important document, not just to the indigenous people for that reason, it was an important document to the Crown because they had just come out of a world war with the French during the 1750s, in which that world war not only occurred in North America between the French and the English over their claim to the land, but it was also in other parts of the world as well, where France and England fought for sovereignty, or for control over various parts of the world. So that world war had worn out both countries, both nations. And so by the time England had succeeded in beating the French, particularly in North America, they were in a weakened state. And they were very concerned, and it's documented in the documents at the time, they were very concerned that the indigenous people of North America who outnumbered them, not only in terms of numbers of people, but militarily, that the indigenous people would take advantage of their weakness and drive them out of the country, drive them out of the land. So they made that promise to them in order to appease their concerns as indigenous people. Because you've got to remember, indigenous people got caught up in that war, one side or the other, they fought for so they had a fair idea of what was at stake between them. And when one side won, the thinking was that all of those who had remained neutral, which was the vast majority of indigenous people, would combine with the forces that had fought on the French side and drive the English out of North America. So the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was very important to the Crown of England. And the Crown of England, wanted it to be important to the indigenous people as well. So they called them together at a gathering in 1764 at Fort Niagara in what is now north, the northern part of New York State and, and Ontario and asked them to gather in order that the terms of the Royal Proclamation could be explained to them. And 3,800 leaders, give or take a few, uh, accepted the invitation together. And there, in their languages, the terms of the proclamation were explained to them. And they were asked to agree to accept the terms of the proclamation. And they did. And that became known as the Treaty of Niagara, 1764. The Treaty of Niagara of 1764 represented a watershed moment in the relationship because again, remember, it was the indigenous people promising to allow the European communities to stay in North America when they could have easily driven them out. But they promised to let them stay, and in return for that, the Crown promised that they would not interfere with their land rights, with their governing rights, with their ability to take care of themselves. And that relationship continued on those terms thereafter for a considerable period of time. And whenever the Crown needed to take land up, they would negotiate settlements. They would negotiate treaties. And those treaties were meaningful documents to the indigenous people. They proved to be less meaningful to the European representatives, particularly to the Americans in the colonies in the United States, because in... in um, 1770s, the Americans decided to break free from the crown of England and set up their own nation, which they did. And the American approach was not to honor the terms of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, but to assert their sovereignty through terms of war to be waged against the Indians. So the war against the Indians started in the late 
1700s and continued for almost 100 years. But in North, the rest of North America, particularly in what is now Canada, the terms of the Royal Proclamation were always on the minds of the English representatives who were here. And when Confederation discussions were taking place, the terms of the Royal Proclamation were known, particularly to the British representatives who were overseeing those talks and who agreed to pass the British North America Act of 1867 and the subsequent Manitoba Act of 1870, which allowed for the Canadian state to be expanded into the West. And one of the terms of that expansion was that the government of Canada had to sign treaties with the indigenous people in the West before they could assert its sovereignty in Western Canada. So that's why, after 1867, you begin to see treaties being signed with great fervor. Treaty number one was signed in the 1871. Treaty number two, around the same time. Treaty number three, the next year. Treaty four, treaty five, treaty six, treaty seven. All of those treaties were negotiated by the government in order that it could expand into what is now Western Canada. You also need to remember that at the time of Confederation, the indigenous people of Western Canada far outnumbered the European people of Eastern Canada. So when we talk about who was really in control of the territory, we have to remember that indigenous people had the largest numbers and had the largest military forces at the time of Confederation. With the uh, signing of the treaties, promises were made in exchange. <clears throat> and at treaty number one, when you look at the negotiation of treaty number one, it's interesting that part of the dialogue was that the Crown wanted the indigenous people simply to surrender the land in return for small payments and uh, the agreement that they could have small parcels of land based upon a certain formula where they could set up their own territorial governments. Uh, the terms of treaty number one were initially not accepted by the indigenous negotiators and instead they brought their own conditions forward. So that treaty number one actually has an appendix called the outside promises. And one of the terms of the outside promises, which subsequently became a term of all of the treaties in Western Canada, was that the government had to promise to build schools on the reserve uh, that was being created for each of the tribes that were signing the treaties because each of the leaders wanted their children to be as educated as the little white children. That's the terms that were used during the negotiations. To be as educated as the little white children because they knew that with Western expansion of Canada, the nature of the economy, the nature of the relationship was going to change. And they wanted to keep track. They wanted to keep pace with those changes. So they wanted their children to receive as good an education as the little white children were going to receive. So they asked for schools. And the government promised to build schools whenever the Indians wanted it on their home reserves, and they would pay for the teachers and they would provide the resources for the children to be educated. And that was in 1871, 1871 with treaty number one. And those promises continued into each of the subsequent treaties. But Sir John A. Macdonald was influenced by what was going on in the United States because he had sent a representative down into the United States to look at the question of schools. And that representative returned with a report that the Americans were not putting schools on the reserves. Instead, the Americans were taking all the children away from the families and putting them into boarding schools. And he recommended that the government of Canada should do that. And the idea was, to, based upon uh, uh, a view that had earlier been part of a report that was studied and made public in 
what was then called the province of Canada, which is now Ontario, that indigenous people could be educated up to a certain point, but they were mentally and socially inferior and could not be as well educated as white children. But they could be educated to be the servants of white people. They could ed be educated to be the people who worked and did the manual labor in the community. And that's what they should be trained to be, the servants in the manual force that served the white community, the white elite. The initial report that was written in the 1880s, in 1858 approximately, was written by a fellow by the name of Egerton Ryerson. You probably heard the name Egerton Ryerson because Ryerson University in Toronto is named after him. I was given an honorary degree by Ryerson University about 10 years ago, and I accepted it. I accepted it because I said in my convocation address to the assembled students, for me to stand up here and to deliver this speech and to accept this honorary degree, in my view, causes Egerton Ryerson to spit in his grave. <laughs> And I think it's about time that we did those kinds of things. And so that's the way you deal with those kinds of historical facts. But Egerton Ryerson had written a report in which he had said the very same thing. And MacDonald believed it because he was a significant figure in the province of Ontario, or the province of Canada as it was called at the time. And uh, he went on to establish a policy of ignoring the promises that were in the treaties about schools, particularly, and building what he called industrial schools, modeled on the reform school system of England. Take children and place them there so that they could be reformed from what they were into something better. So well, that's the model that the industrial schools were based upon. So the idea was simple. You take the children away from their parents and you place them in the industrial schools in a collective environment, and then you bombard them with an educational program that's designed to change them from being indigenous to being Canadian. Sounds simple, but it's actually pretty complicated. In 1885, when he was asking for money in order to justify the expenditure building the industrial schools, MacDonald was quoted as saying, when challenged about the fact that the treaties promised the schools would be built on the reserves, he said, if we were to build the schools on the reserves, the kids would go, the children would go to the schools in the daytime and they would then return at home to their parents, who are nothing but savages. And we would be teaching those children the basic skills that all children learn from schools. And what we're going to end up with at the end of the day is nothing but savages who can read and write. That was his belief. That's why he felt it was justifiable to take the children away from their parents and place them into industrial schools, away from the parents' influence, away from the community's influence, away from their cultural influences, in order to subject them to a process of civilization, which is what the schools were designed to do, a process of civilization. And because they had to do it on the cheap, they decided to involve the churches, who were quite willing to get involved because it was a way for the churches as well to gain numbers through their missionary zeal. And they quickly signed on to run the schools. Quite a number of schools, in fact, were run by church organizations right from the beginning. So through a process of Christianization the children would be civilized and would become like all other Canadians. That was the intent. The reality, of course, is that if you take children away from their parents, you're going to damage them. Right? 
just like you felt, right? Just wiping out that photo from your phone caused you an emotional twinge. Think what it did to the parents. Think what it did to the children, though. It's like to them, you disappeared. You were no longer part of their lives. Children were taken away and placed in these schools and they were placed into an environment in which they were told right from the beginning that they were inferior, they were pagans, they were heathens, they were savages, that they didn't have a culture that was worth protecting, they didn't have a language that was worth preserving, they didn't have a history that was worth talking about, and that they had to learn how to be like white men in order to survive. Otherwise, they were going to become extinct. In the late 19th century, in fact, there was a common belief, not only in Canada, but in the United States, that the Indians were on the verge of extinction. You've seen Edward Curtis's fo uh, photo books, right? If you ever go into a library, you'll see books upon books of photos taken by Edward Curtis who was hired in order to travel around North America to take photos of Indians because the belief was that within a short time those Indians were going to be extinct and were no longer going to be around. And so in the schools, those children were told, your people are going to be extinct. You're going to be extinct unless you follow this formula of becoming like white children. That was not always easy to do. Of course, your tendency is to speak the language that you grew up with. And even though you were taken away when you were as young as five, placed in the schools, your knowledge of your language may not have been as strong as it would have been if you were older, but still you could speak your language. You had to be able to, to talk to your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters. Children would speak their language and they would be punished for doing that. They would be physically punished for speaking their language. You knew a bit about your culture. You knew a bit about ceremonies. You'd be punished for doing that. You'd be punished for trying to keep your friendships with your friends from your communities because they wanted to break your ties to those relationships. You weren't allowed to speak to your older brother, or your older sister in the schools because they wanted to break that tie as well and that influence. So everything was done within the schools to break down the cultural bonds that existed for those children. A recent study was done by the Law Commission of Canada about what happens when you institutionalize children. And one of the interesting aspects of the study are that one of the things that happens almost inevitably with every institutional process that occurs with regard to children is that the children become abused. Children become physically victimized by those who run the schools. It begins with physical victimization so they're beaten, so they're punished physically for doing something wrong because there's literally no one to stop the adult from beating them. No rules that are in place. Nobody overseeing this, these beatings. And that was going on in the schools right from the beginning. But then that also becomes sexual abuse. And in fact, sexual abuse within residential and boarding schools is a very significant phenomenon. In England, a study recently done of the private boarding school system in England shows that there was a higher percentage of sexual victimization of children who were sent to boarding schools than of children who were not sent to boarding schools. And this was in a society of very wealthy people because you didn't get to go to a boarding school if your family didn't have wealth. So boarding school victims and victimization was a predominant problem. So children who were sent to these schools were likely physically abused or sexually abused. And 
If they weren't physically or sexually abused, then they lived in fear that they would be. And living in that fear, even if you never experienced that kind of abuse, living in fear that you might be is also a damaging process. Imagine what it's like. Maybe you already know what it's like just to walk into a room or to go to bed not knowing if someone is going to come into that bedroom at night and hurt you and take you away and victimize you. That's a nightmare. And every night you live that nightmare for years and years. And you live in fear that that's going to happen someday. And maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. Because after a while, you're physically and emotionally and psychologically damaged by all of that. And on top of that, of course, you've lost your language, you've lost your culture, you've lost your relationship with your family because you're not allowed to see them. Sometimes they send you home in the summer times, sometimes they don't. We found correspondence from Indian agents to families saying, we're going to let your children come home this summer, spend the summer with you. But if we learn that you take them to a ceremony, if we learn that you are speaking your language to them, you're never going to see them again once we get them back. So even parents were threatened. Well, let's talk about parents for a minute. If you discovered, and of course the children would, when they came home, they would tell their parents what happened to them in the schools. They'd talk about the abuse. Imagine if you were as a mother suddenly found out that your child, your daughter, your little girl, your baby was being abused by somebody in that school, what would you do? Well, you'd stop them from taking the child next year, right? You'd make sure that they didn't come and get the child anymore. So in the 1880s, the government passed a law. They amended the Indian Act that said that it was an offense a legal breach of law if you did not send your child to a school when the Indian agent told you to send your child. And you could go to jail. And many parents did. We have lists of parents who were sent to jail because they wouldn't send their children to the schools. And then they still got the kids. Sometimes they try to hide the kids. Sometimes successfully, often not and the parents would be prosecuted and go to jail for trying to hide their kids to keep them from going to schools. So if you wanted to stop that, you were subject to prosecution. Well, you're faced with an unfair law then, a law that clearly discriminated against you. But what else would you do? Well, you'd hire a lawyer, right? Everybody knows that if you got an unfair law, you go to court and you ask the court to strike down that law because that's an unfair law. So the government passed another law that said you can't go to court against the government for anything the government does under the Indian Act unless you get permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs first. If you can get the Minister of Indian Affairs to give you permission, then you can go to court. The Minister of Indian Affairs never gave permission in any instance that we were able to discover. So you can't go to court. Maybe you could just go get legal advice from a lawyer and find out maybe what your other rights are. So the government amended the Indian Act again in the 1880s and said any lawyer who agreed to give legal advice to an Indian about anything under the Indian Act, had to get permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs before he gave that advice. And if he didn't get permission, then he would lose his right to practice law. So that's why lawyers were not standing up for these victims of discrimination. Well, what about if you had a white friend, eh? We all have these Friends of Indian Societies. There were many of them that popped up in the 1880s and 1890s. Friends of Indian Societies. 
maybe they'd go to, to court for you. Maybe they would hire lawyers to go talk to lawyers. So they amended the Indian Act in, the 18, in 1888 that said anybody, not just Indians, but anybody who sought a legal opinion from a lawyer had to get permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs before they could go to court. And the lawyer would still lose his right to practice law if he agreed to give legal advice without getting permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs, even when that advice was being given to a non-Indian person. So your right to access the courts was taken away from you. You lost that as a parent, and your children were still being abused in the schools. What else could you do? Well, you could protest, right? Everybody loves protests, right? It's what we do now. We don't like what government's doing. We don't like a law. We protest. So in 1892, the government passed a law that said it was illegal for three or more Indians to gather together in order to discuss a grievance against the government of Canada. And also, it was illegal for Indian people to attend large gatherings. And they outlawed large gatherings like the sun dances and the potlatches, not just because of the religious aspect of it, but also because at these gatherings, that's when the Indians got together in order to discuss their grievances. So it was illegal for three or more Indians to discuss their grievances against the government of Canada. That was known as the Indian Conspiracy Laws. Sort of equivalent to what we now call terrorism laws, right? Against the law now to, today for people to gather together to conspire against the government around the world outside of Canada. Because that's a, considered an act of terrorism under anti-terrorism laws today. But Indians were subject to that law, so you couldn't protest. Because they also, interestingly, did something that was not legal for them to do it. They prohibited Indians from leaving the reserve by saying you had to get a pass. You had to get written permission before you could leave the reserve. So that prevented parents from going to the schools and taking their kids out. It also pre prevented all these protesters from going out and marching in the streets. And then that policy was never actually a law. The past system was never legislatively supported. But it became enforceable and enforced by the RCMP, or its predecessor, the Northwest Mounted Police. They enforced it vigorously. Any Indian person caught outside a reserve who didn't have a pass was arrested and detained. Couldn't be prosecuted because there was nothing to charge them with, but they were locked up anyway. And then they would be returned back to their reserve after a while, maybe. So as a parent, you can't go to court, you can't get legal advice, you can't protest. So maybe what you should do is rise up, right? let's get an army going here and let's go to war. But who's got your kids? The person you're going to war with has got your kids. And it was made known to the parents that if they decided to take up arms against the government, that it was their kids who were going to suffer. They would never see their kids again, for sure. Absolutely for sure. There's correspondence on file that we discovered from the Northwest Mounted Police and from other government officials saying, we don't have to worry about the Indians going to war. This was after the Saskatchewan Rebellion or resistance of 1885. That we don't have to worry about the Indians taking up arms against the government because we have their kids. They're not going to go to war against us. So you can't go to war. You can't protest, can't go to court, well, let's do what everybody else does. Let's vote those guys out of office. In 1885, Indians got the right to vote. Most people don't know that. 
Sir John A. MacDonald felt one way of civilizing these people is make them do what other Canadians do and let them participate in the electoral process. So they were allowed to vote beginning in 1885 until they actually did start to vote and it looked like they were going to lose their election. In fact, MacDonald's conservative government lost the election in the early 1890s. So in order to keep that from happening again, guess what they did? They amended the law. And a law interestingly called the Indian Advancement Act of 1892, Government of Canada said Indians could no longer vote. And they did it through defining the term person. When it's in the elections law, it said any person in Canada over the age of 21 can vote. As long as you're male, of course, women were not allowed to vote. But any person could vote, and then they defined person to mean anyone other than an Indian. So Indians lost the right to vote in 1892 and never got it back until 1961. So the right to access the electoral process to cause change to come about took away another tool in the hands of the parents to do anything about this. So their children continually got taken away from them, placed in these schools. And all the while, the number of children who were being physically and sexually abused was growing and growing and growing. And those numbers occurred from 18... 85, when the schools became numerous in number, until the last residential school closed in 1996, a period of 110 years. That represents about seven generations. Seven generations of children went through those schools. And as I said, many of them were abused, but not all of them. But all of them lost their language, or were threatened if they used their language, lost their culture, lost their concept of community, lost their knowledge of their history, and were trained about being like all other European kids. So they were indoctrinated into another way of thinking. And that did something to them of great significance. Many of them who returned home, of course, suffered from the trauma that they'd experienced at the schools. And the number of children who returned home often, in fact, couldn't communicate with their families, couldn't communicate with their parents. During our hearings, we heard from Inuit people in northern Quebec whose children were sent to residential school or taken away and sent to residential school who initially only spoke Inuit. And when they returned, one of the child they discovered, one of their children they discovered had been sent to a residential school in Quebec. Another one of their children had been sent to a residential school in Edmonton. And he spoke only English. The one who went to Quebec only spoke French. And neither one of them could speak Inuit anymore. So that meant they couldn't speak to their parents. And when they returned home, their ability to communicate with their parents and connect with their parents was lost. Their ability to know how to hunt, fish, or trap, which is what the communities depended upon, was lost to them. So they were lost in more ways than one. They lost their sense of connection to family, to community, and to their culture, and to their very existence. And that continued for seven generations generation upon generation. But it only occurred for a few generations, probably the elders who were alive during that time who were not subject to those schools could have helped those young people to recover by retaining for them and passing on to them knowledge of their culture and knowledge of their language. But the schools were there for seven generations. About 35%, according to some estimates, of indigenous children went to residential school. About 65% did not. 
But why is it that we have a situation of such magnitude affecting all communities where so much of the language and culture is lost? Why is it if it schools only affected 35%, why, what happened to the other kids that they lost their language? It's a good question. It's one that you need an answer for, so let me tell you what it is. It's because those kids were sent to public schools. And in the public schools, those kids were taught the very same thing that the kids in residential schools were taught. And that is that their cultures were inferior, their people were inferior, their language was irrelevant, their history was not worth talking about, and they had nothing to offer the conversation except that they came from an evil place because look what they did to those poor Jesuit missionaries in the 1640s in North Ontario. How many of, the, of you studied Canadian history in the 60s and 70s who know about that story? Everybody knows that story of what was done to burn them at the stake. And so in the public schools, Indigenous children were subjected to the same kind of treatment as those who were sent to residential schools were. But they were also, of course, subjected to the teaching of superiority that the non-Indigenous children were receiving, that they came from superior stock. They came from these wonderful European civilizations from these civilizations that knew about government, knew about confluence of cultures, and knew about language, and had art, and had high ways of doing things, had a form of government that was worth talking about. Never mind, in fact, that much of what was going on within indigenous societies was very similar in nature but it was not taught that way. What was taught was the myth of European superiority and the myth of indigenous inferiority in the public school system. And that also went on for generation after generation after generation. And I know because I went to public school and I was a good student in public school. I was the top of my class. I got straight A's all the way through high school. I was our class valedictorian. I was athlete of the year. I got accepted into university with numerous scholarships. And yet it was all at a cost of knowing my culture, my sense of self. Every society has an obligation to teach children the answers to four very basic questions. I learned this from studying philosophy. Plato says there are five questions. But when I was talking with elders one time, I told them about this teaching of Plato, and they said, well, actually, the four questions are the important ones. The first question is, where do you come from? Where do I come from? Whenever I was, a, as a judge, whenever I would go on circuit in northern Manitoba, the first question they would ask me is, where do you come from? Tell us about your family. Tell us about your grandmother. Tell us about your grandfather. Tell us about your community. What language do you speak? What languages do you know? They would ask me all these questions. It was one of the very basic questions that we all ask as we're growing up. Where do I come from? Babies ask it of mummies, right? How did I get in your tummy, mummy? <clears throat> you all know that. But it's not just about that. It's also about what is our creation story? Where did we all come from? Who are our heroes? How did we get here as a people? How did we survive for all these years? And how long have we been here? What is our story? What is our story to this point in time? 
Everybody needs to know that because it makes you valid, makes you part of this place. It validates you in many, many ways. And the second major question is, where am I going? And that isn't just about what are we going to have for supper tonight or what am I going to do next week? It's also about what happens to me when I die? Where do I go? What happens to my body when I die? Where am I going? And that's a valid question too. And we all make sure that our children who ask that question know the answer or know an answer. We try to give them the answer. And if you don't give it to them, they'll go and find it somewhere else. Where am I going? What happens? But part of it is also, what am I going to do when I grow up? What am I going to be? What can I be when I grow up? And we help them with that answer as well. And the third question is, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? Part of the answer in my culture comes from my name, Mizenigizik. Comes from our naming ceremony, Mizenigizik. Those of us who know our traditional name, know our spirit name, know that with the naming ceremony, there is a teaching that comes with our name. There is a story that comes with our name. And in that story, is your purpose because according to our teaching when the creator creates you he sends a spirit to be part of you so that you are complete with body mind and spirit and that spirit already has a name and the one who names you who finds that name for you is really finding out the name that the spirit that is within you already has. So when I was born, when I was created, the creator sent a spirit to be part of me and that spirit's name was Mizenigizik, the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. And the story of that name is, there was a young man when his people were in trouble and his people were in turmoil and chaos, and they couldn't figure out what to do. That he went out into a high place and put aside his, his distractions and sat there and asked the Creator to show him the signs that he would need to know what to be able to do to help his community, to help his people. And he sat there for days and days looking for the answers, waiting for the Creator to talk to him. And he prayed every day and asked the Creator to talk to him. And he never heard a word from the Creator. And finally, as he was giving up hope, he was getting angry and he said to the Creator, why is it that you're not talking to me? Don't you hear me? I offer you my tobacco, I offer you my medicine. Aren't you listening to what I'm asking you? And at that point, they say, a little tiny mouse popped up out of the ground. And in Ojibwe, called him an idiot. And said, you're not paying attention. Because the creator is already showing you what the answers are. Just look at what he's showing you. It's in the sky realm. Those pictures up there tell you what you need to know. And it was then that he saw that indeed there were images there. That when he looked at them, told him what he needed to know to be able to go back and tell the people. So, my name means I'm an idiot. <laughs> who has to pay attention in order to be able to help the people. But I also belong to the fish clan, and as I say, the fish clan are the philosophers, the thinkers, the seers, the ones who are able to understand things because we are trained that way by other members of our clan. And that's how I help my people, but that's why I'm here. That's my purpose in life. And that's why I do what I do. 
I've always been like that. My grandmother wanted me to be a priest because she went to a Catholic residential school. But my aunties, from the day that I was little, they used to say to me, you're going to be a professor. They used to call me the professor. When we were uh, little, my, grand my grandmother and my grandfather took us in because my mother died. My father couldn't take care of us. And so we went to live with my grandparents. And my grandparents were 63. My grandmother was 63. My grandfather was 69 years old. Kind of a little old to be taking care of four kids under the age of five. And so my grandmother created a child welfare system. She designated one of each one of the aunties to take care of each one of us. So there were eight aunties we grew up with, and each one of them was responsible for one of us. So the auntie that I got was my Auntie Josephine, and she was a teacher. And so I grew up with her. Wherever she went to teach, I grew up, I grew up and went with her. And I was her helper throughout my life. But, you know, when you're the son of a teacher, you end up being instructed a lot. When I was 12 years old, she gave me a, what, what turns out now to be a huge gift, but at the moment I thought, what a terrible gift this is. <laughs> but she gave me a complete set of encyclopedia. <laughs> when I was 12 years old. And it was bad enough she gave them to me, but then she said, now you have to read one of these books every month, and I'll, I'm going to test you on this. <laughs> so I had to read one book of the Book of Knowledge for every month for the next 18 months. Sometimes I had to read two books a month because some of them were thinner than others. <clears throat> So, and she tested me. She would ask me, and she would say, what is an aardvark? What is this? What is that? And I'd have to tell her without looking at the book. So she would know that I'd read them. But being raised by her taught me to love to read, taught me to love to learn, and taught me the responsibility that goes with it because whenever she was a teacher in a school, I would always be one of the students, but because I was usually quite advanced, more advanced than others, I would end up mentoring other students. Of course, it was a one-room school, so I would mentor students younger than me. I was in grade six, I'd be mentoring grade three students and teaching them how to do things. And so I learned how to teach. When I first went to university, I thought I'd be a teacher. but. I realized I couldn't be a teacher. When they placed me as part of my education cert certification program, they placed me in a school in the core area of the city of Winnipeg where there was a class of 42 boys, all under the age of 12, from 10 to 12 years of age, 42 of them. And I was in phys ed at the time, and I thought I was going to be a phys ed teacher. And so my challenge was, as a teacher, was I had to put together a lesson plan, I had to teach it to the kids, and then I had to get them to execute it by Friday of that week, because that's when my supervisor came and evaluated their performance of my lesson plan. So on Monday, I spent all day, the all class day, which is about an hour and a half, and I taught them all the lesson plan, showed them everything that I wanted them to do. And so on Tuesday, when they gathered together, I said, okay, boys, let's get started. They spent the next hour and a half playing murder ball. On Wednesday, they spent an hour and a half playing murder ball. On Thursday, they immediately went to the box in the corner and they grabbed some balls. They were going to play murder ball again. And finally, I said, boys, sit down. I've got to talk to you. And I said, listen, my supervisor is coming tomorrow. And he's going to evaluate me on whether or not you are doing the lesson plan that I put together. So I really need your help on this. What's it going to take? 
That was the first mistake. I mean. <laughs> so what's it going to take to get you guys to do my lesson plan? So Robbie Hughes, I'll remember his name forever. <laughs> I, I was convinced when I was a judge he was going to end up on my docket. But <laughs> Robbie said to me, how much you got? And I said, what do you mean? He said, how much money you got? And I said, I'm a student. I don't have any money. He said, sure you do. He said, you got money. And I said, well, how much are you guys asking for? That was my second mistake. <laughs> I started negotiating. And they said, Robbie said, 25 cents each. And there were 40 of them there, so I did a quick analysis. And I thought, geez, I can't afford to pay these guys 10 bucks to do my lesson plan. So I said, I can't afford that, guys. And so they said, how much can you afford? <laughs> so I did a quick calculation, and I said, how about 10 cents each? How about a dime each? And they had a quick gathering amongst themselves. <laughs> Nobody voted, or Robbie turned and said, okay, 10 cents each. You pay it before tomorrow afternoon, though. <laughs> so they showed up. So that afternoon, we ran the lesson plan. They showed up the next day, time for the lesson plan. I gave them each their dime. I got A-plus on that course. <laughs> they performed the lesson plan perfectly. And you know what the supervisor said to me? He said, Murr, you're going to be a great teacher. You got these kids eating out of your hands. Nobody else has been able to get these kids to do a lesson plan in all the years that we've been sending teachers here. Uh, so I encourage you, he said, keep doing this. Keep, your, keep up the work. You'll be a good teacher one day. And I said to myself, I didn't say it to him, I said to myself, shit, I can't afford to be a teacher. <laughs> Not at this rate. Now eventually I switched over to law. And that's why I became a lawyer. Could have been a teacher, but I couldn't afford it. That's a chapter in my memoir, incidentally. Um, but in the meantime, I want to talk just a bit about the long-term impact of that experience of children in residential schools and children in the public schools and what that means. Because it, it really did have an impact upon all of the children who went to the schools every day. They were dramatically affected by it. They were, they were damaged by it. When they went home and had children, they, were, they had been so institutionalized by the process that they were not able to do, raise their own children effectively. So that more and more of their own children got taken in by the child welfare system. To the extent that by the time the 1950s and 1960s rolled around, most of the kids being taken into care by the child welfare system at that time, which was newly created, were indigenous kids. Most of the people being incarcerated were indigenous men and women. And those trends have continued to this day. And so the question becomes, what do we do about all of that? How do we handle all of that knowledge? Well, of course, in the truth and reconciliation process, you've all heard about the experience that those who were abused in the schools went through and what they need and what they needed in order to be able to benefit from. But what you didn't hear from, because they were largely an invisible force, were the generations of children that followed on the lives of the survivors of residential school, the children and the grandchildren of residential school survivors. Because they too had to live with the downside of residential school. They had to live with parents who'd been damaged by that school experience. And as a result of that, they were unable to be able to function properly as well. That's why we see such high levels of addiction, high levels of criminal involvement in urban areas, and why we see such 
significant numbers of young people who are caught up in the numbers of suicides that are occurring around the world. We have the highest suicide rate uh, for an identifiable group anywhere in the world. And the birth rates are also astronomical. So we need to recognize that that impact is, is quite significant. And so we have to begin to look at doing something about all of that. And where does it all begin? Well, it all begins, I believe, with how we educate our children. We have to start giving back to our children the kind of knowledge about their existence, about their future, about their purpose, that those four questions would have given them if they had been answered in a way that was consistent with their cultures and their communities. They have to be able to, be, to, to answer those questions in a way that they find comfort from. We have to ensure that they grow up knowing what it means to be an Anishinaabe, knowing what it means to be Cree, knowing what it means to be Shtolo, knowing what it means to be Mohawk. Whatever that culture it is that they come from, they should be able to learn that, not just from talk among the students in the playground, but from the teachers in the schools as well. We had a chance to address the ministers of education when we were running the TRC beginning in 2012, and we had met with them every year in their Council of Ministers of Education. And we asked them to create a process by which the curriculum of each of the public schools in Canada was altered so as to ensure that appropriate material was put together for children at each grade level to ensure that they understood the true history of this country and that Indigenous children also received an education about their culture, their communities, their people that was appropriate to their geographical territories. And we had received commitments from a number of provinces, but we haven't yet seen the benefits of that. And in particular, in the First Nations schools, we asked the First Nations schools that were funded through Indian Affairs to do the very same thing. But Interestingly, the First Nation schools are all tied into provincial curricula through education funding agreements that are imposed upon them by the government of Canada. So they have to comply with provincial government rules, which means they have to follow provincial government curricula. And at this point in time, it does not allow them to do that. And that is why we continue to see so many numbers of Indigenous youth caught up in the justice system, the child welfare system, the suicide rates, and the dropout rates as well. It's because the educational system is just not giving them what they need. We have a lot of work to do, but if we address that one aspect, of how our society is functioning, we will see the most dramatic change that um, will resolve or address the history that residential schools have had upon Indigenous people and Indigenous youth in particular. But until we do, we can expect that those numbers will continue to be what they are. Those numbers are not going to drop about because we spend more money on child welfare they're not going to drop because we spend more money on policing or incarceration. They're not going to drop because we spend more money on mental health services for Indigenous kids who are threatening suicide. They are not going to drop because we spend more money on preventing or addressing the needs of Indigenous children in the child welfare system. It is because we finally begin to give back to Indigenous children their sense of identity, their sense of self, and their sense of pride in who they are. Reconciliation is about establishing a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. But it begins with recognizing that, firstly, before we can have that, Indigenous people, Indigenous youth in particular, have to be given an opportunity to develop their sense of self-respect first. And that's going to take some time to do. 
So beginning with that thought, then, I want to ask you to do what you can to help to make that happen. If there is one aspect of the work that we need to do in society that you can contribute to, it is about ensuring that the educational system addresses that very basic need for our children, because that's the way we will achieve reconciliation most easily, most quickly, and in larger numbers than ever before. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this evening's activities. Thank you. I, th I think I want to thank you for the gift of wisdom, but I've got to say that I found one part of your presentation difficult to believe, and that is that you couldn't control the 42 kids and Robbie Hughes. <laughs> I think if I tonight. Had more money, I could have. <laughs> well, I didn't mean in that way. I don't. Th I've been to many of these uh, lectures, and um, they've been magnificent. But today's is emblematic of bringing together the legacy of Janusz Korczak and the uh, intention of a faculty of education that has at its core social justice. So I want to thank you very much. I want to say two more things. Um, <clears throat> one is that um, the senator has told me about your granddaughter last evening, and whose picture would be here as a focus. And he told me, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, that he writes and has written a letter to her every day of her life and she's 13 years old. What a magnificent legacy. His comments to us was a wonderful gift, but imagine that gift. The other thing he told me the other night was that uh, he once spoke for six and a half hours. He said, how would that be? I said, well, <laughs> you know, if you go on like that, I'm going to have to snatch the talking stick out of your hand. <laughs> but I couldn't do it. So thank you once again. Please join us out at the reception and, um, yes? Fourth question. <laughs> go, go ahead, you had the, the three. Where have I been, where am I going, and who, why? I would have thought that'd be an obvious question. Fourth question is, who am I? Who am I? Plato says that's a big question, too. Plato says the fifth question is, where does life come from? But who am I? So that's the fourth question. All right? Good. Glad you were paying attention. Please join us outside. Thanks.